Hi, I'm Chris C, the founding director of the Costec project, coming to you from the land of the Web3. The last couple of weeks, NFT became all the rage. Everybody's talking about it. New York Times, Forbes, Crypto Press, Cultural Press. It seems like everybody and their favorite influencers and idols are thinking about issuing non-fungible token or NFT so they can sell their work, sell their artwork. And people have made some, somewhere around thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. And the most famous one made 67 or 68 million dollars. Uh, that's crazy uh, money. Uh, as a person who has been really interested in crypto and more namely, worked on an NFT project, maybe the very first M M NFT project in 2014-15 called Monograph. And that was built on the Bitcoin blockchain. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I also understand that people got excited over this idea of NFT, especially around this idea of artwork. And I think it's fantastic. It's the type of aha moment that I got personally. And I gave a talk about that after maybe two or three weeks after I learned about Ethereum and the potential of uh, digital art on the blockchain. You can uh, watch this video right there. Uh, and right now, when I look at this whole field, I say, you know what, this is a great opportunity for us to not only know that this NFT movement is never going to go away. We're in a post-NFT world. Once you get that idea in, the, 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 the idea is out of the gate. People are going to go iterate on it and do new things. But there's a lot of concerns. People are saying, hey, does NFT create a situation where people are going to be burning down the forests and creating global warming because of all the really expensive type of mining that goes into um, operating blockchain like Bitcoin and Ethereum. There are question about when you buy an NFT, do you really own it? Is it something that uh, is just an autograph, it's not the actual thing itself? And there's also a question about whether this is just a fact, where these ideas of NFT and flipping for profit is going to create this kind of bubble, like a tulip bubble where it comes and then goes away. Or is it something deeper? Or is it really we're beginning to see that the transformation of the relationship between uh, consumers, audiences, and the creators? And obviously, at Costec, we really believe that the future of creation, or the act of creation, is at the core value uh, of distribution, the value uh, genesis that would drive us forward and move us away from the centralized power of Silicon Valley towards a cooperative or, uh, cooper uh, or, or shared ownership. Uh, around everything that we do, not just around high art and digital art or content or crypto art, but in all aspects of our lives. So it's worth today spending some time to think about uh, what is this NFT thing is really all about? And most importantly, what is inside the NFT? There are some questions recently about, you know, what is the ability for us to actually own these kind of digital objects? And what's really cool is to see that within a week, that from the New York Times article announcing that Christie's, a traditional auction house, has sold for $69.3 million, Beeple's every day, first 5,000 days. This is this amazing collage of an artist's journey from a novice to a expert and, 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 and a practicing artist that is selling an artwork that may be one of the top five most expensive artwork ever sold. And this is what I think most people realize that the idea of NFT and the idea of p recording that transaction on the blockchain is now mainstream. It's from the New York Times. And then uh, John T. Waring, uh, this has 6,000 retweets, uh, including uh, 2,000 quote retweets are saying, you know, out of curiosity, I dug into how this actually, this NFT actually referenced the media and I want to see, you know, what are you actually buying? And then lo and behold, quickly, <laughs> this is a short verse, I'll read it to you. NFT token, you're either going to URL or hash in certain circumstances, it is hosted by the startup. So this is really still a centralized, as in a company, a, com a marketplace of minting application, essentially have to be stay alive forever for this whole NFT to exist. Because what's on the blockchain is simply a pointer to this URL, this pointer. So I go look here. And it goes a little deeper than that. When you were looking at actually the NFT itself, sometimes it's hosted by a company. So the Beeple artwork that was sold was hosted by Makerplace, which is an NFT minting platform. 
But if that company or that organization, that corporate entity goes away, that will go bust. And this information, which is kind of the description of this NFT, may go away with it. So the question is, you know, whether this is really a house of cards where it, would these NFT withstand the, the, what we expect of especially high art that gets preserved and it gets uh, last forever, would they be one day be worthless when the things underneath it, right? The, the information that is pointed to or referenced by this blockchain record, uh, would that go away? Would it just disappear? It's like you bought nothing at all. So the question really is, is what is in an NFT? And I think what I, one way to think about it is NFT, even though the word token suggests that it is a thing, it's really many layers of many things within this bundle. Let's unpack this. So what we're going to do today is to look inside the NFT to see, and I counted about 10 little layers or like candy wrappers of sorts that gets to the core of what an NFT is. Spoiler alert, we're going to talk about how an NFT has its foundation in a blockchain transaction that proves the existence of something that you can own, which points to metadata to describe what you're actually owning, including the ability to get at the content that you're owning. And that content needs to be persisted somewhere to be saved, to be stored. And it needs to be rendered when you want to look at it. It could be you or it could be someone else that you're selling to. And then these people, buyers, sellers, curators, are participating in this market and that market, once you purchase and show the ownership, you get permission to do something with this media. So this is basically the 10 layers of this NFT circle. Okay, So we'll go, go through each one and maybe look at you know, where we are today, where we're going, and how can we address some of the problems that's been raised by people who are interested and fascinated by NFT, but are trying to ask the question, not only what's next, but how can we make this better? So let's start with the, the bottom layer, the transaction. So as an OG uh, in crypto that has done maybe the first NFT platform, the first way to the, the, the recognition is that you can store something in an NFT, NFT uh, this transaction record on a blockchain. And the Bitcoin blockchain is a couple of ways. You can put it in the field called op return, which is like a member field and a check that you can write something on it. So you, I can send you zero dollars of Bitcoin or very close to zero uh, 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 dollars worth of Bitcoin. And then in there, write and say, hey, and with this transaction, I transfer ownership of this thing. So op returns about 40 bytes, pretty short. And then you can write something on it. The monograph system is based on op, uh, op return. Now there are other version of the Bitcoin form, namely the Namecoin one, which the very, very original version of monograph that uh, Kevin McCoy and Neil Dash present at the 77 conference uh, uh, that kind of started it all, uh, they were writing to something called Namecoin, which has a slightly larger feel because it's designed for domain name registry on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, so you can write uh, more information on it. But basically, the transaction is on a Bitcoin blockchain of some sort in the past. And with Ethereum, with the programmability, especially with the emergence of the non-fungible token standard called ELC721, now you can create a, a more complicated, a more interesting, and more standardized transactional record about who owns it, what is it, and who, who, what is the history of ownership, and how do you actually transfer and keep track of that. Now, obviously, with both Bitcoin and Ethereum, there's a concern about the carbon footprint, which is that what a, you know, every, you know, to operate the Ethereum blockchain and then the Bitcoin blockchain, you miners had to use a lot of electricity to keep these, you know, mining equipment going just to create and uh, uh, compete in this competition of to make the next block. Now, I don't think, however, that NFT is directly tied to proof of work because proof of work is only one of the consensus mechanism that blockchain can use. There's emerging a set of new uh, competing blockchains, some of which are their own little blockchain on the side. Some of them are layer two, so they lay on top of a Bitcoin or a Ethereum, which is where most of the activity goes, where they can give you the same transaction, this core, the center spot of this NFT candy shell uh, that is much more uh, 
uh, energy efficient. Uh, now obviously Ethereum 2 uh, is gonna uh, have some uh, claims of being able to be a transition away from proof of work, which has worked really well, but has its problems, to proof of stake, which has different set of problem, but at least would not be as high of a carbon footprint. So with this transaction, what we can do is to record with it the existence of something else. Because we're not talking about the asset that is the, the transaction record on the blockchain, which is usually a financial asset of some sort, we are trying to prove that some content exists. So a piece of content, a GIF, a JPEG, or something like that, you can say this content exists, so I create a a, a hash, which is like a signature of it. Look at every byte on the thing and come up with a signature. And this is the very first version of that in 2040, it's called proof of existence. So let's say you have a file, right? Like you have a proof, you have a file that's really high value, maybe some leak from a government or something you have made. You can create the hash of that content and publish that hash onto the Bitcoin blockchain with those 40 bytes on the, uh, on the op return. And then, you can later on, maybe 10 years later, claim that, you know, how do I prove that I had possession of this document? It's because there's no way in hell anybody would be able to say, put the signature, this hash of this content at that time. Because when you put it on the blockchain, you prove that that happened at that time. So proof of existence could be, I put something on the blockchain, you don't know what I put on the blockchain, you just know that later on when I show you the content off chain, you can compare it to the hash store on chain and say, ah, you had this uh, material back in 2014, or you can prove to me that this ex document existed back in 2014. However, that's not super useful for being able to transfer a right to something. If I want to transfer something, I actually need to know from the blockchain record that there's a pointer from the blockchain to a record that says that this document, or at least the hash of this document, is what was on chain at the time. So a lot of the new NFT, including all the Ethereum one that's in, in works right now, uh, stores a pointer on chain of some sort that is a URL, like a link that says, hey, there's some additional data that, that exists on that. And that way we can say that whatever that's pointing to is uh, what you're owning. So the ownership record is on chain, the pointer points at the other stuff, which is further up the chain. Now to own something, any type of blockchain assets, especially ones that are, are done in Ethereum, you need a Web3 wallet. So a wallet that is able to communicate with the Ethereum virtual machine, the model that uh, the count model, so you can say who owns what, ha do, what do you have, can, can you transfer it, and you sign and approve messages to move them between other people. So you need a wallet. But there's currently two types of wallet, and there's a telltale sign of which one you have. So one is called custodial wallet, which is a wallet that has a that someone is hosting for you. So NBA Top Shot and Nifty Gateway are both a platform that has a login and sign a button, which means that they are hosting the wallet for you. They have a wallet on their server, and then you're basically kind of visiting their server with your credentials, and then they will then issue the command to either view, transact, or transfer the assets. A non-custodial wallet, the telltale sign is that it has a connect wallet uh, function, usually on the upper right. And foundation uh, is one of those that does it, and there's a couple, uh, many other more, where you have to have a wallet, whether that's a Google, uh, Chrome, Google Chrome plugin like MetaMask, or a Rainbow wallet, which is a iOS wallet, or even some of the other ones that is on the App Store, of which you, can, you control the key in your wallet and then you are actually directly issuing the command to the blockchain to transfer that. That ownership transfer, right, that you can move this uh, token around, or is similar to moving it money, is where people can flip money, m make things for profits. So the ownership part is really the game we're playing right now. I claim to own something, I'm flipping the ownership of that. Now, obviously, we need to know what you are flipping the ownership of, and that's where the metadata come from. So the metadata is similar to the war text in the museum. You walk by a painting and a little corner of the painting, there will be a little description like what the name of the painting, what year, which artist, some description about that. And that could be from the curator, it could be even from, uh, from, some, some, from source information uh, that they dug up from the ground, something that was an artifact. 
Um, in the world of NFT, this is represented by the JSON document. We saw a version of that for Beeple work that was hosted. So the, the JSON document uh, exists um, as a description. So it should be attached uh, to the work. But here's the thing. The work, the ownership record is in this blockchain, so it's everywhere and also nowhere. So most of the time, these metadata are hosted by the app that minted it. So it could be from the marketplace, so it could be whatever, they host a version of it. Uh, and the marketplace basically keep the record of like, oh, I know the description of this work that the artist intend. Uh, a lot of them will publish this particular thing uh, this particular JSON document, this kind of JavaScript based notation structure of the fields of title, description, year, whatever it might be, they will put it to a decentralized storage. But either way, regardless of where it's hosted, the metadata exists uh, as another artifact next to the actual content. So the content is what you're viewing, right? So the supported media types would be something like video, it could be an NFT, it could be uh, an image, it could be an audio file. There's a lot of really interesting experiments around different audio file. Usually, uh, in the current generation NFT, you are not getting the original file, you're getting some sort of exported file. Like a PDF is an example of it, right? It's an exported file from Word, but you're not getting the original Word document or the manuscript. Which creates a slightly interesting question. When you're buying a generative art, so let's say you're buying a uh, CryptoPunks, which is a uh, kind of like low bit rate uh, generated uh, avatar character. There's, I think, 10,000 of them, and they're generated from an algorithm. But you're not, when you're buying a CryptoPunk, you're actually buying the out exported file, the thing that is created, the content that is generated from the algorithm. But it's starting to be interesting as people exploring NFT as a way to deal with new formats and new templates that maybe we can actually think of content not just as what is generated by a computer program, but the parameter to create that as part of that content. So the code, the code base, the, the actual AI algorithm to come up with a new tune is part of the content, not just a, 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 a preparation of a, a material that generates the content. So we're blurring now slightly what content is. If you want to create new formats, uh, new games that you may make the MNT, the game code, the actual logic of the game has to be part of what we consider content. And the template would be taking this game code logic and creating a level, and that is new content. So when starting to kind of uh, explore and maybe get to the saturation point of traditional media types, video, uh, audio, and text, and then getting into uh, content being generative or software-driven or software-defined. And that creates questions about how do you do the next two things, which is persist and render. Let's talk about persistence. Persistence is basically how do we know that this thing will be around when I want to look at it later on. So two approaches. One is do it for me. So I don't want to host or persist this file. I give it to someone else. It could be the minting platform or it could be another platform. Right now, a lot of the NFTs are still have an umbilical cord to the place it was birthed or minted. Uh, if that platform goes away, you may lose some part of this candy shell of the NFT. You might have the ownership record, but maybe be missing the content or the metadata because the place went away. But if you can create a situation where you know we have the opportunity to host it, we have to defend against it at a rock pool. Actually, one of the artists used this as a way to kind of demonstrate the fragility of this generation NFT, which is that they 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 he created this uh, NFT and then deleted the underlying content, like the level five content, so that the NFT that is in your wallet disappears or it got changed to another image that was not what you bought. Now, it could be a nice uh, performance art uh, as a way to express the uh, commentary on the way NFT world is today, but this rock pool is gonna make it very hard for people to, to understand or be uh, respectable uh, of this whole new commercial uh, uh, method. Uh, the other way that you can get really screwed on uh, this do it for me thing is that a lot of these contents are hosted on the IPFS, uh, interplanetary file system, I believe, which is you put the file and you ask a network of uh, nodes to say, please keep this file around for me. But they don't have to. 
you don't pay them, it's free. So if they want to keep it around, if everybody, at least one person or one node decide to keep your uh, amazing rendering of a frog around, then that will go around forever. Great, you're lucky few. But if nobody is intended or have the incentive or feel the need to keep your uh, image or your video around, it will go away just because nobody cares to keep it around, the memory fades, right? Um, so IPFS pinning is a way to say, I want to make sure that at least one copy, one copy of last resort exists here. And that usually requires some sort of a, a cost on it. And one way to do this is to use another protocol like Rweave, which is a protocol that allows you to essentially spend money to create a permanent storage. And there's an incentive mechanism within the protocol to ensure that the miner of the Rweave uh, token uh, have incentive to keep the stuff that's been published by the users uh, around forever. Now, it's not clear whether that's gonna last forever, but it, there's at least an economic and incentive mechanism to uh, do that. So there are services that are, or at least recommendation to combine IPFS, which is easy to put in and access to with Rweave, which is has this incentive system for permanence or archival uh, to, so that, to do it so that even if you ask someone to host this uh, uh, content and or metadata for you, it will be around uh, when you need it. But there's a, another way to um, uh, make something persist, which is do it yourself, save a copy. So this is what you, you know, a lot of collector or in some cases the museums who bought this artwork do. There is a whole department focused on preservation. We bought this thing and it could be a painting. You preserve it by making sure that it doesn't fade or like you put it in a case or make sure that you restore it, whatever it might be. And preservation does not mean you just keep it around and don't touch it. Sometimes it requires active work. But the act of preservation is a, 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 a self-reliant. If you're an owner of an artwork, you have the responsibility, or at least you should have the responsibility and hopefully the financial incentive to keep it around. So why wouldn't you download all the metadata, all the content and keep a copy of it? Yes, the blockchain will be replicated, uh, the record that will be on chain will be there, but the stuff that's pointed to, the stuff that you actually bought the right to, you need to do that. Now, there's no easy way to do that in the world of NFT right now. All these things are somewhat opaque behind beautiful user interfaces, but uh, we haven't really gotten to a point where that there's a practice or best practice to do uh, preservation. And there's also loss prevention to make sure that if somehow the, the, there's a rug pull from the creator, uh, maybe the IPFS is pinning or maybe Rweave or whatever protocol is not able or have, doesn't chose not to keep your thing around, you should at least keep it in a USB stick. So being able to decipher and unwrap, hopefully in a more standard and reliable way, what is pointed to in this metadata content so that you can persist this is gonna be a really important part to make sure that these content or these type of object or work can last outlast of the particular fad that we possibly are in. But beyond persistence, there's also the rendering. You know, when I say, hey, I bought this digital uh, uh, this JPEG, I'm gonna view it. Well, there's a lot of software to view a JPEG on your computer. You don't see it because it's built in. There's a preview app or like uh, there might be a finder or explorer that are, know already how to render it. Photoshop has built in support for JPEG. But if you have a slightly more advanced format, uh, maybe something that have a high definition or something that is a new type of video codec or this 3D involved, then you're getting a beyond uh, what is uh, built into the computer. So the easy stuff is stuff that's uh, supported everywhere, like images, audio, video, and text, and maybe HTML pages, things that, that exist as a, 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 a media of which the players are commonly in commodity available. We're mostly still in this phase. We're using uh, uh, things that are easily playable within the operating system and a, uh, and a browser to do that. The harder stuff is AI generated media where you may need the AI model around to see it. Mixed media expression where things are interactive in a certain way, you need the code that ties those things together, the logic and the, and the front end code or even maybe the back end code if it's taking a data feed from somewhere. 3D spaces, you need to know which rendering engine you're using, which game engine was Unity or Unreal. And there um, goes on and on as we move away from like simple media type to 
expression that can be made into NFT and sellable and whatever it might be, but that may be beyond what is currently uh, uh, easily uploaded to a Dropbox. So the question then becomes, do you own the code that is rendering your NFT? Because if you lose the player, I don't know if you've ever had a file that you had a program to open, but you lost the program, but you still have a CD of the file. Well, that file is literally useless to you. You, you don't have to, you, don't, you can't see what's in there because the code, the software that renders your content, in this case, the NFT may not, uh, may not exist anymore. So it is, it is my opinion that a fully ownable NFT up to the point of this rendering layer, the layer seven, requires that it's 100% open source code base, or at least source available code base that is rendering everything out. Now, browsers are somewhat open source, so, so people uh, uh, have these open source browsers, so anything on the web platform is generated, okay. But any proprietary software, let's say there's a new uh, music AI engine that allows you to create new type of generated music, well, is their code from that startup open source? Maybe the investor wants them to do that. Maybe the investor doesn't care that they open source the code base. But if you cannot run and render and playback and interact with this NFT in 10 years after the company or minted it goes away, after the artist dies or goes into hiding, then you don't really fully own it, do you? So I do believe that when you get to the rendering part, you start looking at the software that's underneath the media itself, the rendering, the persistent, and say, hey, we really need to preserve that and making sure that those things are as available at the moment of interaction that you can reconstruct all that stuff from the code bases as well as the media expression in the player. So rendering creates a really deep question about what is software? What is this platform that are being built by this software? Are they something that you own as well? Uh, are the platform that's minting an NFT going to allow you to see it or in the way that was intended, even if they go away? And this is really important point, which is as a creator, you can only choose, uh, create with the tools that's available to you. And you are one of the participants in, in the world, but you're not the only one. Now, one of the great innovation and the amazing thing to see this actually happening uh, in, in, in a significant way is the idea of a creator share, uh, which came out of this 70 experiment of the artist reserve rights, where the artist reserves the ability when they're painting a physical, you know, oil on canvas painting, it's so they get 15% of the thing, uh, of the upside. So, so if you, uh, you sell something for a thousand dollars and then the collector end up selling for a million dollars, you get $150,000, uh, which is really good. Now that's really hard to enforce in the world of paintings and 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 uh, and, and uh, physical storage. But on the blockchain, we know who the previous owner is, and it's, it's difficult. It's not. It still requires the marketplace to work together. But it's also something that can be at least enforced or at least informed the person buying it that there is such a artist creator share clause in this original NFT minting. So. The cow, however, the creator is not always the minter. The person who's actually minting the actual NFT on the platform uh, may be someone that is a delegate, maybe a uh, the equivalent of a gallery uh, gallerist that works with the artist doing that. It could also be minted later on. So the artist uploaded a work and then they wait until someone or buyer comes and is interested in buying it before it's minted. So minting could be automated, could be someone else. And Here's the interesting thing. We've been focusing on NFT as a thing that you need to mint on the most valuable blockchain, in this case, Ethereum mainnet, where all the value and all the tokens and all the stable coins that tracks US dollar pricings uh, exist and they mingle together. That creates a situation where minting an NFT requires you to do a transaction on an extremely expensive block space. Um, so that means that sometimes minting an NFT on this platform will cost you $80. So artists uh, may not have $80 times 100 works just to see if one of those works gets purchased. So one way to solve this problem is to do layer two minting. So you mint it, you have a blockchain record, but it's another blockchain, a cheaper blockchain. It's like you know, not in Manhattan in New York City, but across the street in maybe New Jersey or somewhere where the land's cheaper. And then you mint, you bridge it, you bring it back to layer one 
and most likely uh, the first owner that is coming in to, uh, to, to, to buy your thing from this cheaper blockchain and say, hey, I want to bring it to the marketplace in uh, the, the, the busy, high bustle marketplace on Ethereum mainnet, let me pay the bridge toll, which could be $80 to bring in. And that balances out the, 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 uh, the initial um, uh, risk that the creator or the minter is getting and then allowing the first owner, the first uh, maybe speculator, maybe the first uh, collector and fan to do that bridging for you to have this work, preserve it, make sure there's only one of that on either chain. And there are really uh, great technology has been maturing in the last year or two around bridging between these uh, multiple Ethereum, EVM-based, Ethereum virtual machine-based network that allows uh, a bridging of tokens, uh, so fungible token as well as non-fungible token. And if an owner come in and say, hey, I am a very famous artist, could be Kanye West or something, or Barack Obama, and I bought this artwork and suddenly make the provenance or make the actual history of ownership much more valuable. This artwork or this NFT became just a lot more desirable because of the fact that you know, this famous person bought it. And they can get a sell on share. That's another way for them to participate in the economic return of the thing. And certainly, we're already seeing in the, in the, in the uh, Beeple example of the $69 million work where you know, a, a organization that has multiple owners or, or multiple owners working together can actually buy an artwork. And there's a couple of ways to do it. There are these Web3 wallet that are called multi-signature wallet where within that wallet, uh, there are two signers. So, so both of them, they agree before they can transfer it. So now you can create a 50-50 relationship between two uh, collectors and have them act as one, one address or one actual wallet permission to purchase this uh, uh, piece of ELC721 record. And then they will have to both agree before it gets moved or gets uh, sold or transferred to the next person. Uh, that's one way to do it. But the idea here is that an NFT uh, has a lot of participants, maybe curators that comes in and 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 find and 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 brought together a bundle of these things and then sell it and then get a little upside as well. We're gonna expect a great deal of uh, new people, a new role, a new judgment coming to this field to allow the media and the, the ideas to find its final destination, which may be a somewhat kind of convoluted journey, but whoever helps get you from point A to point Z deserve a slice uh, of the upside. And obviously when we go do this and create this kind of network structure, you still need customers. Customers buying, your work at the right price. And currently there's a couple of types of marketplaces, uh, one of which are kind of like eBay, so like OpenSea uh, of, or, or Rarible where everybody lists their product on it of different types of sorts. And it's like a flea market and you just, uh, people set prices and then you just go on and, 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 and buy it at the price, that the, the asking price. There are ones like Zora, which is very interesting, that has a built-in order book where you can, each artwork comes with its own mini market. And then based on what has been bidded and asked for different people, you can either sell it as like a buy it now in an eBay sense, or you can do it in a way that is more uh, um, uh, a auction process as well and the decentralized exchanges that has been working in like fungible token like zero x protocol um, and and will warren which is the lead of the project say hey we have the mechanism because tokens in ethereum space are more the same than they're different um, so it's actually not that difficult to create exchanges or order books for mixing and matching. I give you two of these, then I get you one of those. I exchange two of these less valuable crypto kitties for the more expensive one. And these are things that is possible uh, in using a decentralized exchange. And finally, once an NFT is owned, there might be market to buy a fraction of it. So uh, if the if the Beeple uh, uh, artwork is $68 million, and then you expect it will go up in price uh, with some instrument, and, and it's, it's questionable how what kind of regulatory uh, uh, um, infrastructure needs to be to make that happen, you can certainly imagine from a technical point of view that you can turn that ownership into 
a fungible token, so 100% of the Beeple artwork, and you can buy 1%, 5%, 50% of that. And then when that sell, then you get the value that comes with that. So this is the type of markets that wraps the participants. And then when these kind of uh, liquidity event happen, when something sells, and it trickles down to the participant in the different ways and the terms has been done. And that's how market relates to it. And then finally, the outermost layer, and this may not actually be the obvious thing, it's about permissions. What are you actually buying, right? When you're buying the actual ownership record on chain, it implies something. And right now, it implies that you own it, but there's no consequences because everybody has access to the same artwork because the actual content and metadata is simply on a URL, you can go to the blockchain and find it and you can enjoy it on a big screen. You don't need to be an owner, you just need to be someone who is resourceful enough to go trace and find a URL and paste it into Chrome and then there you go. You, there, there's no more, your, your TV is not any better or worse than the TV of the collector who bought the actual ownership record layer three. So there is the opportunity to do private access for owners. So, so there may be a, a, a low resolution version that everybody has done, but you have to prove that you own the key to ask the owner before you can encrypt this like other part, which has like the high resolution, 8K, maybe even higher. What excites me the most is that what the private access allows uh, for the owner is that you can actually get the source file. So imagine something that's like a really nice rendering, like a little animation, motion graphics. Instead of just getting the video file, whatever resolution, it, you actually get the After Effects file or you get the, uh, the 3D model file that you can open up. Uh, and that is gonna be the highest fidelity. It's like getting a vector version of a logo allows you to scale it out without losing fidelity. And that is one of the privilege, maybe not the only permission, but one of the permission. And to do that, you need to create a way where the ownership record on chain, on the Ethereum chain, allows you to decrypt another storage. And that could be using technology uh, from New Cypher or Keep Network, two of the uh, projects that recently announced that they're gonna do a hard merge, I think, I believe, where they bring the technology together. But this is kind of what we're seeing as the possible frontier NFT of what comes after this, is this idea of a private access bucket for this. The other way is not about the file itself, but the, about the actual ownership record. So let's say a artist sold a bunch of NFT, like a thousand things, and say, by the way, I'm gonna create a new website that you can come and talk to each other, but you have to own at least one of my pieces from this series to get it. And that's called token gated access, which is that you have to have the token before you can show it. It's almost like showing that, hey, do you have one of my CD of the show? Where you want a CD before I can get you in? And Collab Land uh, and, and is, is, uh, is doing something like that. I think it supports both regular token, community token, so owning one of a particular token like Friends with Benefits, FWB, or, or whatever it might be. So I think there's a lot of interesting thing of using the ownership record or some sort of participation within that ownership record as a way to permission you into valuable communal experiences as well. Contractual rights is like a, the more loyally part. It's not really about whether you can access the file or you can access the space because you own a particular collectible, but it's to say, can you do anything with the thing that you bought? Right? So one way to do it is if I have access to the source file, uh, did I buy the permission from the creator to make my own version of this animation? Can I like tweak the color because I like green? And is the version that's green version mine? Is it, does it belong to the creator? Can I mint the green version if I have the source file and I change the color within the modeling tool? Uh, can I sub-license this and can I take this thing I bought for $68 million and create a line of Lunchables on them and using this as the cover art. Did you license Mickey Mouse to likeness to use in a lunchbox? Uh, did I license this particular you know, anime character? So there's these questions that exist in the intellectual property or IP space that right now, I think we're only beginning to ask the question, what do you actually buy? And I actually believe, and this is something that, that, uh, uh, that I've thought about and I'm actually a 
uh, listed as an inventor of one of the first blockchain write transfer patent uh, related to the monograph project, where we thought about having a token of some sort representing the remix right, the sub-license right, the commercial use right to use in a billboard. And the artist doesn't have to sell them. If they do sell them, however, they are as valuable than the kind of conceptual ownership of the title of the work, right? Uh, as like a collectible. But these are also where non-fungible token and this idea that there are sub-tokens that represent these additional rights that you can sell or not sell with it. You can certainly sell something as a limited edition, you can enjoy it, but you cannot sublicense it. You can cer or certainly do and have a situation where it's reversed. You sell something in the open edition, anybody can own this work, but only a few people can use it commercially in a commercial or in an ad. Uh, so contractual rights is another set of permission that may actually go back to thinking about what, what the ownership record actually means. And finally, when you own a, uh, a, a NFT for music, that's the new hot thing right now, uh, where people, catalog is on one project, uh, you're owning the music, but are you owning the income of that music? Because one of the things that's in, in commercial music in, in the label world, the music record label world, and in film studio, is that what they really think about every day is not just about how much, you call, uh, how much they're selling the, the, this film to you, a lot of the streaming revenue, but if they own the title of this movie or this song, they get this long-term royalty stream right income stream from that owning the ip so every time you stream something on spotify it pays back to the label and then whoever owns the percentage ownership or rights of that song gets money in their bank account is it possible to use blockchain to do ongoing royalty or in some cases for individuals in income share whoever owns this nft gets a share of my future income or even uh, for the series or whatever it might be so you can use it as a way to share the upside uh, with, uh, with, with, with owners and such and such. So as we can see, this is roughly the 10 you know, concepts that, that exist when you say, what is in, inside my NFT? There's a transaction record, the proof of existence, the ownership record, the metadata to describe it, the content that reveals what it is, the persistence to keep it around, the rendering to make you interact with it and see it, the participants of different sorts, the market that help buy and sell it, and the permission you get if you own it. And that's a lot of stuff that when you say this is an NFT, you have to consider all of the aspects. So when people are kind of either criticizing or having discussion of it, you have to say which part, which layer, which kind of onion skin of an NFT are you describing and as a way to figure out what it works. Now, obviously, the blockchain part is mostly the blue part on the bottom, which is transaction existing ownership and metadata. But the part around persistence and rendering and what the content type is, how do we encode the metadata, is really a cloud thing, right? This is something you're gonna host either in a decentralized storage or, or on a website that you can go visit just by typing a URL or download an app that gives you that. that. And there is some tricks here, right? Which is the fact that this is cloud, so there's a lot of incentive, a lot of uh, kind of a easy way to turn this into a centralized platform where this minting platform that deals with the rendering and persistence and the display of this stuff end up being uh, in control uh, of enough of the parts of this NFT core that even if you own the core, you don't really own the whole thing. And then the part around marking the participation and permission is really an interaction between the blockchain and cloud. So if I do a token gated community, I'm saying that the cloud, which is hosting my Discord group or Telegram group, is respecting a record of blockchain, bridging those two gaps. And, and the other one is also in reverse. If I'm getting a royalty, uh, that means that the cloud, like a streaming service of NFT or like a display service, a subscription service to view NFT, pays into a pool and then it goes to a blockchain distribute it to, to the different participants of this network. That idea of connecting the cloud and blockchain is uh, it's in, in its nascent state. There's a few experiments. Uh, it is, however, most likely where this participant market and permission system is going to have to live. In, I've, in our view, in my view, it will be very difficult to think about all 10 components in 10 different websites, 14 different apps, 16 different URL, 12 different block explorer, six different types of uh, records that you need to look and, and inspect. It would be much nicer if these are components 
the, they're like codified little blocks of information. They can piece together and compose into this whole thing. So we've been promoting and then been in working on the framework to support the idea of a card UI to bring these things together. Uh, and then, so that's a mostly around the user interface aspects of it. But more specifically, a community an member asked me, like, you know, what are you actually working on related to NFT? Well, the part that I believe that is most not worked on in a decentralized way is the part around metadata content persistent rendering. Right now, these platforms are silos, not all that different than Tumblr and Twitter and Snapchat being silos. They're going to be like, oh, if you want to do video, you'll go to this minting platform. If you want to do audio, you do this minting platform. I don't, I don't think that is the foundation of creativity for this composable world. What we want to do is create mixed media opportunity where any content that is an NFT can be combined with any other content or renderer of an NFT to create greater and greater work. To do that, we have to solve this idea of decentralizing rendering, decentralizing persistent, decentralizing content and metadata and allow any type of rendering and persistent content metadata to interact to form new things. So this is what we're working on at Castec with uh, from the application framework. So this is a JavaScript and web platform kind of things, which is we think that it's important that if you're going to create a work that's an NFT, that you want to be able to render your work uh, to display the user, to allow user to, and your collector and your participant to interact with it, where you can use 100% open source code base. The marketplace open source code base, the minting farm is open source code base, the ability to see the history is open source code base, and that code base can include upstream library, which is publicly available and open source as well, so that the entire stack that is underneath your NFT is open source. So. If all the services go out of business, right? Kind of apocalypse, and you find a USB stick and you have a computer and it has Linux and it has uh, a Mac OS or something like that, you can actually reboot the entire rendering of your work just with that alone. Uh, so I think the preservation of the rendering uh, being open source is a key part of making a truly decentralized NFT world. And the other thing is that you want to be able to persist to any storage of your choice. Right now, a lot of it's on IP IPFS, and I think it's great. But if there's new protocols or people want to keep a copy of USB stick, you want to archive it in the Arctic uh, as, a, as a vault or something like that, uh, the, the actual files itself is just media file and byte streams and then JSON document. We have to be allowed that to adapt to different types of what we call pluggable realms, different types of storage mechanisms that could be protocol centralized. The way to keep content forever is to make many different copies of it and to work on migrating something from an old hard drive to a faster uh, flash drive to an SSD, whatever it might be. As long as you keep preserving and moving things from one medium to another medium, you have a chance of preserving it. So this idea that an NFT is not tied to the storage mechanism of its birth is a really important one. So that requires a framework that allows you to adapt the storage. And from a content form, form of point of view, we don't want to restrict ourselves to just native like media types. We want to be able to use JavaScript in the web platform. I believe it's the most long-term sustainable platform because it's open source, it's open standard. It's a lot of people who are web developer who knows how to do it. So if you want to create a new type of 3D content, please use JavaScript and 3JS and all these kind of amazing WebGL capability within the browser because that's going to last longer than if you build it on a proper proprietary library that may not outlast a decade, right? So JavaScript is a really powerful programming language and an ecosystem of code base that allows you to take full advantage of web platform. And I think the web platform is going to really, really be the one that's going to outlive, but it's still very expressive. You can do videos, uh, 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 real-time compositing, all the things that uh, uh, multimedia artists worked on, you can do on a web platform. And that's one way to make sure that that code base on that code that is necessary to render can, can be stored with the content and serialized in a way that will persist hopefully forever. And finally, the metadata uh, about what the thing is, is it can be done in an extendable way. We have a card schema, which is uh, based on JSON API, which allows you to express any type of uh, database type of relationship uh, and then kind of create new fields, title, date, you can add to that. And once someone creates a schema, you can say, oh, my work is just like that person's work with different uh, uh, values, obviously, but I can use the template almost like they're using the Excel spreadsheet, but fill in the information. 
But this is the coolest part. Because the JSON schema we use is based on this web or hypermedia standard uh, called JSON API, you can actually link between them. So in your work, you can credit someone and you can use a URL uh, and say that person is a collaborator or that person is uh, the person who provided the music or this thing is what I use as an inspiration. And that creates a web of links uh, between these work that allows you to explore and kind of, kind of surf over this relationship. And that's what I'm really, really excited about, which is that as NFT becomes the driver for getting new content in, we're able to continue to capture more metadata and the linkages between them in a JSON format uh, that, that is easy to edit, kind of like tagging your MP3, but provide the value to the entire world by way of this on-chain pointer to these JSON document that then link together which tapestry. So you can literally like click on your collection, serve and kind of follow the trade win and get to a totally work you, of a new artist you've never heard of because of the linkages in the metadata. And that's something that we worked on a lot in the Card SDK, which is the way for us to create these schema document that has this amazing rendering and customization capability. At the root of it, however, is a somewhat formal, semi-formal structure uh, using JSON that tie these things together. So how, how is this related to our roadmap? So we published this particular slide a couple of weeks ago, which is that we are the you know, cooperative SaaS platform, a software platform that's open. So this is a pl platform, the whole platform cost that you can own because it's 100% open source. Not everybody needs all the tools. So there are many different types of tools. So you can choose the tools and then you can do whatever you need to do on it, whether that is to create content, data, relationship, transaction, whatever it might be. The first thing we're working on is Card Pay, which allows you to use this framework and specifically, specifically our protocol for allow people to cheaply pay each other, almost like credit card payment, but on chain. Right now it's very expensive to pay people on layer one. So we're building a layer two protocol, leveraging the new innovation and the new type of bridging infrastructure so they can actually spending and earning a much cheaper transactional cost and then bridge back in bulk when you need it on a mainnet or layer one net. But once you have that infrastructure, we're building something called CardSpace, allows you to build and host uh, websites or catalogs that has these decentralized features. So instead of having login sign up on CardSpace, you have Connect Wallet. So this is requiring you to have a custodial wallet. We support the Wallet Connect standard. And that allows you to even build your own gallery or build your own uh, uh, store to sell your own NFT. Because it doesn't really matter what you put in there because each one of those things are card and represent itself. And it's a unit that you can assemble to represent yourself or your brand or your business. And the way you can decide what your space is that you can go to a card catalog to choose pre-built cards with this template and schema that you need. And some of which are gonna be NFTs. So you can choose like, video minting card and then say, hey, let me use that template, like a Word template, Excel template, and fill in information. And we click a button and you sign up in your wallet, you're minting an NFT. But because we do it in layer two of the infrastructure we built for card pay, it will cost you 0.3 cents, right? And later on, when a buyer comes in, they can bridge it back or you know, kind of transfer and ship it back to the uh, main blockchain and they will pay the 30 or 40 bucks to create the equivalent of this thing lock it up on layer two so it's only one copy is alive at any, any given time. And then you can get the upside as well because it uses the same Ethereum address infrastructure. So this idea of minting platform is something that we debated whether it makes sense for us to do because the, I, we believe that NFT minting is somewhat of a commodity, but more importantly, we don't really believe that you should have a different minting platform every mint, mint uh, content type. Because cards are flexible content type can support anti content type, it makes sense for us to create a minting platform for cards that has this additional record that contains this blockchain uh, information or blockchain uh, minting instruction uh, along with the media or the content or rendering experience you see. So these are the things that will release over time. Uh, we're working on the logic of what kind of smart contract features in addition to the standard ELC721 they want to support so that uh, any card can have a record. And so basically any card you create, even a customer record or some little uh, notes ready for yourself, you can make it an NFT just by adding an NFT field and it will have a minting capability built in. So we see Cardstack as this platform that allows you to have the type of creativity to build any type of workflow you want. But we also know that the only practical way to do this is to start small. 
So starting with CardPay, getting the mechanism of the wallet in place. So with CardPay will be the Castlight mobile app, which is a Web3 wallet tuned to the type of use cases that is more content and more uh, payment oriented and less uh, focus on investment. And with that capability, I think people will really uh, be able to find this themselves being able to operate the machinery of the blockchain and understand how those blockchain features interact with cloud stuff like you know upload your image here who uploads it what's your right it's an additional terms of service so by building this decentralized SaaS platform we can take away the concerns of the hosting part and focus on the type of media the type of content the type of module and code that allows you to reflect and and express yourself in a new way developers if you're thinking about building an entity platform, uh, we would love for, to talk to you about building on Castack so that your foundation for your stack is an open source stack based on JavaScript and web standard so that whatever you build, a new generative art, generative music, or something I can't even describe and imagine uh, using deep fake in a good way or something like that, uh, I would love to be able to have that be something that sits on top of this tapestry of opportunity in the catalog that people can host uh, and, and pay for the hosting and be able to own the responsibility to preserve that NFT and leverage uh, uh, new chains that are cheaper and more environmental friendly to really extend the promised NFT to a new type of relationship we see between creators, their fans, their patrons, their business partners, and their network of community members that may be part of their ownership structure and part of that sharing of opportunity, sharing of upside, and sharing of responsibility to preserve and grow. So I hope this was a helpful uh, introduction to NFT. Uh, for some those of you who know NFT, I hope I've reviewed uh, at least my thoughts on what NFT can do and what the post NFT media will look like, taking this basic uh, uh, genesis as an idea that we we uh, played around with in 2014 and now come into cultural significance in 2021 and bring it as to the operating uh, system of the 2020 decade. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. Um, if you have any questions, do go to our Discord and Telegram links below. Uh, and if you want to hear uh, more from this Web3 series where I talk about uh, ideas like DAO and NFT uh, independent, maybe sometimes of what Carsex is working on, just sharing our knowledge and understanding of how this feels likely going to evolve, then click subscribe on the YouTube channel, and then uh, you'll be able to be notified when we premiere a new video in the future. Again, thank you very much, and we'll talk again soon.